Good morning. This hearing will come to order. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's hearing focused on the racial wealth gap. I want to thank our distinguished witnesses for sharing their expertise today. We have an all-star panel, and I'm excited to hear from them. As everyone here knows, wealth and the accumulation of wealth enables opportunity. Wealth makes it easier to pursue an education, buy a car or a home, or even take a chance on an idea and start a business. Wealth is security, and having a financial cushion allows families to absorb at least some financial blows, like, for example, those experienced because of COVID-19, or a medical emergency, or a loss of a job. And wealth begets more wealth. It's often passed from one generation to the next. Indeed, our tax policies have made these transfers much easier to execute. Our state tax provisions alone enable couples to pass up to $23 million tax-free to their heirs. But unfortunately, the inverse is often true. With minimum or negative wealth, avenues or opportunity are too often closed, a problem that's perpetuated from one generation to the next. Our nation is plagued by persistent and growing income and wealth inequality. And this inequality is particularly tenacious along racial lines. According to the most recent data from the Federal Reserve in 2019, the medium white family had a wealth of eight times the wealth of the median black family. The absolute differences are far greater if you look at the average or the mean. One other statistic helps shine a spotlight on the inequities. While 25% of white households have a net worth in excess of 1 million, only 4% of black households do. And that racial wealth gap disadvantages black and brown families, individuals and communities as persistent inequities and in wealth, they manifest in all kinds of ways. For example, black students are gonna take on a lot more student debt than white students. And they're a lot more likely to see their debt grow as they enter the workforce. Black families have much lower home ownership rates. Fewer than one half of black families own their homes compared to three quarters of white families. And even the black homes that they own are disadvantaged just because those home values are lower than those of the homes of the white families, about a third lower. Beyond the damage, the racial wealth gap does the black and brown communities and families. It also constrains the U.S. economy as a whole because we're leaving an awful lot of very talented, very bright, very creative people um, out of the most productive parts of our, our labor force. So it limits our growth and our productive capacity. How do we get there? Well, much of the racial wealth divide today is explained by the inability of black families to transfer wealth from one generation to another. And this is the product of decades of systemic racism and exclusion in our country. With policies such as redlining, restrictive covenants, and other forms of housing discrimination playing a role. But the racial wealth gap is also a result of the tax code that disadvantages Black Americans in the way it exempts gains on home sales, its treatment of income for married couples, and even the tax incentives provided for employer-sponsored retirement plans. The gap is the result of dramatically unequal access to credit and financial services. Black Americans are much more likely than white Americans to lack access to these basic services. Uh, their proposals, though, the racial wealth gap is pernicious since it requires sustained, multi-pronged effort, and we'll hear a lot of the good ideas from our panel today. Baby bonds provide every child with an interest-bearing account at birth that would ensure that when they're 18, they have assets to use on education or to start a business or other productive uses. We also need to do a lot more to improve access to education the strong pre-K to 12 opportunities, married with improved access to affordable post-secondary education. Tuition-free community college is part of that, and student loan forgiveness is another part of that puzzle. We also need to acknowledge that education is far from a panacea. The typical Black family with a bachelor's degree, Black man or woman with a bachelor's degree, has less wealth than the typical white family with a high school degree. Disparities persist even after accounting for income or family structure, reminding us that we need to be intentional about asset building. The House passed out of committee legislation, H.R. 40, which was named after the failed promise to provide former slaves 40 acres of mule. And this legislation calls for creating a committee to study reparations. Now, this is an important step to face up to our nation's past to begin the process of providing compensation and restorative justice. We have a long way to go in our country to close this racial wealth gap. We're only gonna get there if we dramatically intensify our efforts. And this is why I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses today. And now I'd love to turn it over to Senator Lee for his opening statement. 
Senator Mike Lee. Thank you. Thank you very, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning to all of you and thanks Chairman Blyer for convening our hearing today. You know, at the heart of the American dream, um, we find the ability to build a productive and happy life for oneself and for one's family. It's always necessary to that endeavor to have the opportunity to build wealth. And unfortunately, while average wealth for all American households has uh, fortunately risen in recent years, it remains a fact that Black and Hispanic households have consistently held less wealth than white households. Wealth is built, of course, through the accumulation of assets, <clears throat> and this can include the accumulation of homes, of savings, and <clears throat> in many cases, of inheritance. But accumulating assets requires income, and <clears throat> income requires opportunity. One of the critical questions that we therefore have to ask uh, in order to address the racial wealth gap is <clears throat> one that deals with how best can we increase opportunity for those with less wealth so that they can build more? And what are the things that tend to get a, in the way of opportunity and, and, and especially of upward mobility? <clears throat> As um, Martin Luther King wisely observed, a productive and happy life is not something you find, it's something that you make, but it is, of course, something you make with other people. Indeed, supportive relationships and institutions are vital to facilitating opportunity. The Social Capital Project of the Joint Economic Committee has, for the past few years, studied the health of families and communities and institutions of civil society. Um, and what we've done through that effort is to try to document changes in social capital over time and <clears throat> its sometimes uneven distribution geographically across the country. Often <clears throat> there are historical injustices that, <clears throat> that can have far-reaching consequences for future generations. One of the project's striking early findings was that there is a connection between those counties with large enslaved populations in 1860 and the counties with the lowest rates of marriage and intact families today. You see, slavery stole agency from black Americans and it did so for generations, tearing apart one of the most vital supports that, that exists for human flourishing, that is the institution of the family. This horrific legacy that it left, as well as just the horrific legacy of racism as a whole, undoubtedly led to far-reaching consequences for Black opportunity. But other policies have also weakened social capital and opportunity. Uh, many Black Americans have paid the price for government-sanctioned redlining, for lack of lending resources for homes, and businesses and union job discrimination that their parents and grandparents may have faced. These policies made it much harder to build intergenerational wealth. Today, there are still other policies that present barriers to opportunity, enduring policies that lock so many out of affordable housing, of a good quality education and good job opportunities. For example, <clears throat> unequal access to quality education plays a large role in upward mobility and economic success. Unfortunately, because of public school zoning and residential zoning policies, many minority children from low-income families are required to attend lower-performing public schools. And as a result, they're less likely to do as well on standardized tests, graduate from high school uh, than they would otherwise be and uh, also less likely to have other opportunities uh, uh, to move on to college. They're more likely to end up unemployed at one point or another, and um, uh, more likely to end up uh, in lower skilled jobs with lower earnings, especially if they haven't gone to college. Occupational licensing laws are 
often a needless barrier to work, especially for disadvantaged Americans. Many states have onerous requirements for jobs that can be done with little risk to the workers themselves and to those they serve, including jobs performed by florists, hair braiders, and barbers. And those requirements also make it hard to earn a living. Similarly, zoning and land use regulations present the formation of home-based businesses that would allow for more black entrepreneurship. And zoning segregates Americans by race and by class. Our current safety net programs include some disincentives for work and for marriage, keeping many minorities trapped in a cycle of dependence and poverty and preventing wealth accumulation and stable family formation, which very often go together. Family stability also plays a key role in affecting long-term opportunity. White children are nearly three times more likely than black children to be born into married households. And children born into married households are in turn less likely to be in poverty and more likely to achieve upward mobility. In fact, one study found that the greatest predictor of young black children's ability to move up to a new income class often involves the presence of black fathers in their neighborhoods. In these and other areas, we have much room for improvement to address existing barriers and to, to enhance opportunity. But it's important to add that as far as we have to go, uh, as far as we have remaining left to go in, in making progress, we, we have made some progress too. Personal agency is not lost and many black Americans have advanced and, and um, are, uh, have flourished in spite of the barriers and discriminatory legacies they've faced. As my friend and colleague, Senator Tim Scott recently said, quote, just before COVID, we had the most inclusive economy in my lifetime, the lowest unemployment ever recorded for African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asian-Americans, the lowest for women in nearly 70 years. Wages were growing faster for the bottom 25% than the top 25%. That happened because we focused on expanding opportunity for all Americans, close quote. Together, I believe we can continue working to expand opportunity to help all Americans build a happy and productive life for themselves and for their families, and thereby make savings and, and wealth accumulation a reality for all. Abraham Lincoln, in his message to Congress on July 4th, 1861, wrote that the leading object of government was quote, to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life, close quote. It's my hope that this hearing will help us do the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lee, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And uh, now let's move to um, Introducing uh, our witnesses, uh, we have four distinguished witnesses. We have Professor Dorothy Brown. She serves as a professor of law at Emory University School of Law. She's a nationally recognized scholar in tax policy, race, and class. Professor Brown's legal scholarship includes co-written books on critical race theory and taxation, uh, and federal income taxation. In March of 2021, she published *The Whiteness of Wealth*, which examines how the tax code disadvantages Black Americans and perpetuates the racial wealth gap. Professor Brown graduated with a Bachelor of Science from Fordham University, a JD from Georgetown Law, and an LLM in tax from the New York University School of Law. Then we'll have Professor Derek Hamilton, a professor of economics and urban policy, and the founding director of the Institute on Race and Political Economy at the New School. He's one of the leading researchers in the field of stratification economics. His work on the racially disparate effects of public policy structural advantages in the U.S. economy has led him to advocate for a number of proposals to make wealth more equitable. These include baby bonds or trusts and a federal job guarantee. Professor Hamilton earned his B.A. from Oakland College and a Ph.D. from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Professor Marissa Baradaran is a professor of law at UCI Law. In July 2020, she was 
named as the law school's associate dean for and diversity and inclusion. She's a distinguished scholar whose published work largely focused on banking law, financial inclusion, inequality, and the racial wealth gap. She's written two books, On the Other Half Banks and The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, the latter of which won Best Book of the Year from the Urban Affairs Association. Professor Maradaran earned her bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University and her JD from NYU. And then finally, we have Mr. Ian Rowe, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center. He's also the founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, which is a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools opening in the Bronx in 2022. Previously, Mr. Rowe was CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of public charter schools. He served as the deputy director of post-secondary success in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and in senior roles at MTB and at the White House USA Freedom Corps. Mr. Rowe has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a BS in Computer Science Engineering. Professor Brown, let's begin with your testimony, and then we will continue in the order each of you is introduced. Professor Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to share these views on the role that our tax system plays in perpetuating the racial wealth gap. In my testimony today, which draws upon research in my book, the whiteness of wealth, how the tax system impoverishes Black Americans and how we can fix it, I will discuss three ways that tax policies are increasing the racial wealth gap. The one thing that I would like you to remember is that the racial wealth gap will not be eliminated without a fundamental change in our tax laws. First, marriage. Roughly nine in 10 married couples have their taxes changed because of marriage. Half get a tax cut, 40% pay higher taxes. My research shows that the half most likely to pay lower taxes are disproportionately white, while, 40, while the 40% most likely to pay higher taxes are disproportionately black. It is largely a function of the joint return combined with spousal contribution to household income. A study of black and white families over 25 years showed Getting married significantly increased the wealth holdings for white families, but had no statistically significant impact on African Americans. I believe the marriage penalty disproportionately paid by black married couples was part of the reason why. While the 2017 Tax Act temporarily eliminated the marriage penalty for many married couples, it left intact the significant marriage penalties found in the Earned Income Tax Credit along with high income households where black Americans are still more likely than their white peers to pay higher taxes. My proposed solution is a repeal of the joint return. It would Im immediately eliminate the marriage penalty and singles penalty currently being paid by hardworking black taxpayers who would have more money available to save towards building wealth. Second, student debt. Black students leave college with more student debt than their white peers. Over time, black debt grows while white debt decreases and the black white student debt gap is present across income levels. Not even wealthy black taxpayers can protect their children from higher student loan debt the way their white peers can. Tax policy does not help. The deduction for interest on student loan debt is limited to $2,500 per return and subject to income limits. By my calculations, the gap in debt means that there are years where Black Americans are unable to deduct all of their interest. White Americans with lower debt loads are more likely to be eligible to deduct all of their interest. Researchers have placed student debt at roughly 10% of the racial wealth gap when a college graduate is 25 years old, but by age 30 to 35, it explains about 25% of the gap. I have two solutions, increase Pell Grants and student debt forgiveness. Pell Grants cover only 29% of the average cost of tuition, fees, room and board at public four-year colleges. Increasing the amount of Pell Grants should enable future generations of Black college students to graduate with significantly less debt. I support targeted debt forgiveness for 100% of student loan debt for households with below median wealth. Congress must also ensure that any debt forgiveness is tax-free. 
the median household wealth of a white high school dropout is greater than the median wealth of a black college graduate. Part of the explanation lies in family financial transfers, which is my third example. Research shows that gifts and inheritances explain about 5% of the racial wealth gap. White Americans were five times more likely to inherit than Black Americans, and for each dollar inherited, white families were able to use 91% to increase their wealth compared with only 20% used to increase Black wealth. When it comes to gifts, Black college graduates are more likely to send money to their parents while white college graduates were more likely to receive money from their parents. Once again, tax policy makes it worse. Gifts and inheritances are received tax-free, while transfers by Black Americans to help support family members are not tax deductible. While there is no single tax policy change that can eliminate the racial wealth gap, I propose a wealth tax credit for all taxpayers in households with below median wealth. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee today and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Brown, very much. Uh, and uh, you will provoke many questions, I'm sure, with that, which is uh, And let's move on now to, to Professor Hamilton. Uh, we enjoyed our wonderful conversation with you early last year, and the floor is yours. Good morning, good morning, Chairman Bayer, and good morning, Ranking Member Lee and other esteemed members of the committee. Our enormous and persistent racial wealth gap is an implicit measure of our racist past, a past rooted in a history in which white Americans have been privileged by government, political, and economic interventions, as well as entitlements that have afforded them access to resources and the iterative and intergenerational accumulation that comes with those resources. This is in contrast to a history for Black and Indigenous Americans where their personhood and whatever capital they may have been able to establish has always been vulnerable to the exploitation and extrapolation by state complicit confiscation, destruction, fraud, theft, terror, and other acts of violence. As a result, Blacks as a group have very little ownership in America's land or means of production and remain in fear of violence, incarceration, in state facilitated exploitation. Still, much of the framing around the racial wealth gap focuses on the poor choices and financial decisions on the largely black, Latinx, and poor borrowers. That framing is wrong. The directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely than meager economic circumstance, not poor decision making or deficient knowledge, that that constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no financial options but to attain and use predatory financial services. These last resort debt trap render the recipients of them, these predatory products, modern day indentured borrowers. What's more, high achieving black Americans as measured by education still exhibit large economic and health disparities relative to their white peers. What we do is we overstate the functional role of education to the detriment of understanding the functional roles of both wealth and power in the first place. Racial inequality and despair are not inevitable. This is good news. Rather, they are the result of political choices, and likewise, we can make different political choices to change them. To achieve racial justice, we need an honest and sobering confession of our historical sins for slavery, a point in American history in which Blacks were literally capital assets for white land-owning plantation class, and for sharecropping, white capping, Jim Crow, and the exclusion of Blacks from New Deal and post-war policies by both design and implementation, those policies built an asset-based white middle class. Reparations provides a retrospective, direct, and parsimonious approach to redress the Black-white wealth gap. Moreover, it would require the U.S. to take public responsibility and atone for that long history of racial injustice. As a complement, baby bonds is a seed capital prospective approach, a program that in perpetuity would establish an economic birthright to capital for everyone. The accounts from these baby bonds would be held in public trust, similar to Social Security, 
and be used as a capital foundation when every child reaches adulthood to access an appreciating asset like a home, like a new business, that all those attributes that general, generational wealth affords Americans. The extent of our dramatic and unjust racial disparity is at least as much a problem of politics as it is a problem of economics. Public provisions of baby trusts or baby bonds will go a long way towards eliminating the transmission of economic advantage or disadvantage across generations and establish a more moral and decent economy that facilitates assets, economic security, and social mobility for all its citizens, regardless of the race and family economic position in which an individual is born. And in my last minute, I just want to bring up the word opportunity. I fear that that word has become a, po a political ruse, that it's become a distraction, that it has become a, a mechanism by which we can put the onus of these structural barriers right back on the individual while absolving the state of responsibility as it related to creating some of these structural inequities. Like I said, the good news is that we can redress this past. We can do things by lessons from the past where we pursue anti-racist, anti-sexist, economic rights so that every American has the necessary ingredients so that they can truly have authentic agency and achieve um, their self-determined goals based on a, a, a good concept of economic freedom. Thank you. Professor Hamilton, thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Professor Marissa Baradaran, who's the University of California, Irvine. Professor? Uh, thank you, Chairman By uh, uh, Byer and Ranking Member Lee for the opportunity to testify today. When the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, the Black community owned less than 1% of the U.S.'s total wealth. More than 150 years later, that number has barely budged. The gap between average white wealth and black wealth has increased over the last decade. Today, across every socioeconomic level, black families have a fraction of the wealth of white families. Without targeted policies to close this wealth chasm, it will continue to grow. The racial wealth gap was created, maintained, and perpetuated through public policy. Federal, state, and local laws and policies enforced segregation segregation and created a race-based bifurcated economy. Black men and women have been shut out of most avenues of middle-class wealth creation. Black homes, farms, and savings were not given the full protection of law, even as these properties were subject to racial terrorism. In employment, education, housing, farm loans, even patent rights, racist policies and practices have either shut Black communities out of the market entirely or offered them separate but subpar services. The American middle class was created principally through a government-supported credit infrastructure that didn't cross the red lines that policymakers drew around Black neighborhoods. Those very same red line communities were targeted then with the most toxic loans during the subprime crisis, this time without the federal guarantees. Those communities had yet to recover from that blow when they were hit yet again with the devastation of the COVID crisis and the unequal distribution of the PPP loans. This is a system that can accurately be described as Jim Crow credit, separate and unequal. Many of these discriminatory policies of de jure exclusion have thankfully been abandoned and some have faced, others have faced scrutiny. Yet the racial wealth gap remains because the damaging effects of these policies have not been directly remedied and counteracted. The wealth gap that those red lines put into motion continues and will continue unless it is disrupted by the same policymakers, namely Congress and the regulators it oversees. In order to achieve true racial justice, we must reckon with the fruits of our nation's history. In fact, I believe it is the myths that we tell about our history and economy that present the biggest hurdles to achieving economic justice. Myths that blame those who were the targets of discrimination for disparities that they did not create and myths that offer personal responsibility instead of justice. In my own work, I have tried to debunk two of these myths in particular. One, the myth of self-help finance as an avenue to wealth creation. I call this the George Bailey myth. And two, the myth of personal decision-making, the bootstrap myth. There are no amount of individual spending decisions and savings decisions, no amount of lattes, avocado toast, or sneakers foregone, and no amount of hours work that can counteract the forceful headwinds of historic policies. People do work hard and people do make hard financial decisions, and yet they still face the legacies of racist policies in segregated schools, neighborhoods, and access to mobility. 
No matter what the family structure, the wealth gap exists. Black and white families who do everything, quote, the right way, get married, get an education, buy a home, start a business, save their money, and still the racial wealth gap persists. In fact, the gap is highest at the very top of the income and education ladder. And just to be clear, investing, working hard, getting an education, starting a, bin, a business are all great things to do. My point is not that these things aren't worth doing, it is they, that they have been done for centuries. From investing hard earned wages into the Freedmen's Bank, to marching for jobs, to taking out a mortgage, these prudent financial decisions were often taken amidst a history of exclusion, exploitation, violence, and very virulent racism. Black institutions have been creative and innovative in serving their communities in hostile climates. There's a long history of entrepreneurship, self-help, and mutual uplift. HBCUs have provided a stellar education. Black banks have lent to Black businesses, churches, and families. They've offered credit where the FHA refused to guarantee loans. And Black families have invested in these homes at great personal cost, as these homes were um, had differences in value. The racial gap in home values is just one example of the tangible effects of his, a history of exclusion. The racial wealth gap is where past injustice breeds present suffering. In order to move forward, we need public policy that disrupts these patterns that sustain disparities in wealth. Um, the racial wealth gap was created by exclusionary policies coordinated across the government. It was created systematically through tax, banking, and housing laws, and private markets sustained by federal subsidies. This is exactly the level of holistic coordination across government agencies that is necessary to close the gap. As President Biden said, we need to make the issue of racial equity not just an issue of any one department of government. It has to be the business of the whole government. In my written testimony and elsewhere, I had suggested several steps, and I'm running um, out of time here. Um, but uh, I will say that policies must provide a meaningful path toward capital creation, access to low-cost credit, financial inclusion, tax justice, and home ownership grants. In other words, the same programs provided to white families over the last century. And I will conclude again with the words of President Biden, that it's time to act now, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because if we do, if we do we'll all be better off for it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And we have circulated all of your written testimonies to all the members of the committee too, which I'm sure we have all diligently read. And now let me move on to our, our final witness to Mr. Ian Rowe. Mr. Rowe, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Bayer, Vice Chair Lee, and distinguished members of the Joint Economic Committee, good morning. I'm a proud product of the New York City public school system, kindergarten through 12th grade, and a graduate of Brooklyn Tech High School, Cornell University College of Engineering, and Harvard Business School. I'm a founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of international baccalaureate high schools that we're opening in the Bronx next year. And for the last 10 years, I led a nonprofit network of public charter elementary middle schools in the heart of the South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan, educating more than 2,000 students with nearly 5,000 on the wait list, primarily low-income Black and Hispanic kids. Our parents knew their children would likely face discrimination in their lives, but they chose our schools because they wanted their children to develop the skills and habits to become agents of their own uplift and build a better life, even in the face of structural barriers. In District 8, where our schools are, only 2% of the nearly 2,000 public school students beginning high school in, in the South Bronx in 2015 graduated ready for college four years later. By contrast, at our all boys school in the South Bronx in 2018-19, nearly 70% of our students passed the state math exam. As we as a country have crucial conversations about racism, it is easy to forget that the racial disparities we are seeking to close now originate early in life, long before they show up as statistical gaps in financial wealth or home ownership or educational achievement. According to the Federal Reserve's 2019 survey of consumer finances, the wealth gap between black and white Americans was $164,000. As a result, today's public discourse is dominated by the disempowering narrative that unless institutional barriers are removed, black Americans will remain trapped in a perpetual cycle of economic victimhood. New York Times reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones argues that, quote, None of the actions we are told that black people must take if they want to lift themselves out of poverty and gain financial stability, not marrying, not getting educated, not saving more, not owning a home, can mitigate 400 years of racialized plundering, end quote. 
Imagine you were a 12 year old black boy living in the South Bronx with aspirations of working hard to achieve the American dream. Yet you are repeatedly told there is nothing you can do individually to achieve that goal because you're black. Not only does this message of hopelessness depress human motivation, it also ignores the tremendous public investment that has been made to fight poverty. U.S. spending on poor children has increased 17-fold since, since the 1960s. Federal spending on means-tested programs is now more than $300 billion per, per year. Consumption-based measures place the U.S. child poverty rate at less than 5% today. Yet the racial wealth gap does persist for certain communities. But what's interesting is that the same 2019 survey of consumer finances shows that when family structure and education are considered, on an absolute basis, the median net worth of black married two-parent college-educated households is nearly $220,000, and more than three times that of the typical white single-parent household, which is $60,000. That $160,000 uh, gap is almost equal to the racial wealth gap we often discuss, but in reverse. As we consider strategies to create an opportunity society and upward mobility for people of all races, I submit to you the two-pronged philosophy we practice in our schools. Start early with the end in mind and study the success of those who have achieved excellence, not just equity. If we know there are factors beyond race, such as education and family stability, that can make a difference in generating wealth, we should promote empowering policies like school choice and launching national campaigns to encourage young people of all races to adopt a new cultural norm, encouraging education, work, and responsible parenthood in that order instead of defeatist messages. I look forward to our, uh, your questions and thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Rowe, thank you very much. We'll now turn to uh, questions for our various participants. And uh, as the Temporary chair, I get to begin. So I'll start with five minutes. Um, and then we'll be followed by Senator Lee and then by, by Joyce Beatty. Uh, Professor Brown, if I can begin, you explained that for every dollar inherited, white families were able to use 91% of their wealth to, of that inheritance to increase the wealth, but black families only 20%. Why that difference? What what are what are black families doing with that other missing 71%? They are often helping to support family members who were born during Jim Crow and didn't have opportunities that others did. So Black families are more likely to have extended family members, uh, Black Americans are more likely to have extended family members who need financial support because the government had programs that systematically excluded them. In addition, Black Americans are paying higher taxes. You, uh, I was also surprised that the that inheritance explains so little of the wealth gap, only five percent. Uh, you know, my impression was that you know the the white families were getting a lot more from, especially baby baby boomers like me, from parents than than black families were. And so part of part of that is most Americans don't get inheritances. So there's a smaller slice of Americans that get inheritances and. That smaller slice, though, disproportionately benefits white Americans. So part of why it's only 5% is many Americans don't get any kind of an inheritance. Thank you. And Professor Hamilton, I know you're a huge champion of baby bonds, which uh, Senator Booker and Ms. Presley and, and even Chairman Neal are all working on. Um, one of the arguments I've heard for baby bonds is that it, it has a universality to it. That is not specifically for for uh, black families, but that anyone who's significantly below the the, the wealth line um, would qualify. Do you see this as being helpful, especially in anticipating potential white backlash to programs that are focused on black families? You know, wealth inequality is not a problem unique to black households. It's amplified by the fact that. Um, we have that long history. So making it universal, I think, is akin to our most successful public policy, arguably our most successful public policy, which is Social Security. We have something for people when they age into the elder part of their, their life course, 
but nothing for young adults at a key point where they're building a lifetime of economic security. What makes it anti-racist, even though it's universal, it's still anti-racist. The reason why it's anti-racist is because the do domain for inclusion, as well as the outcome that's intended from the policy, is very tied to wealth, which is um, a distribution in America in which we're most disparate. So, you know, just going back real quick to the inheritance question that you asked, uh, Dorothy, I'd say that um, inheritance bequests, they account for more of the racial wealth gap than education, than household structure, or any other characteristic. But what's more, race is more determinant of one's wealth position than class itself. And baby bonds would address, redress that. Great. Thank you, Professor, very much. And Professor Radaran, um, you, you focused a lot on the millions of black and brown Americans who are underbanked or have no banking at all. Can you explain how this leads them to be in a dis disadvantaged position in every other way? Uh, yes, the, the banking system, you know, besides access to uh, credit, it is also a uh, sort of public uh, system whereby uh, you can engage in financial transactions. So the merger wave of the last you know, several decades um, has made it such that se many communities, especially LMI communities in the rural West, um, in the South, and in uh, uh, just LMI communities in general have lost bank branches, which means that they have to pay extra through payday lenders and check cashers. So it's a fee that is collected upon people who are at the bottom of the income and, and wealth scale. And it's a tax, really, that that the wealthy don't pay. Uh, more, uh, on top of that, there's the, uh, the, the fees that the banks charge themselves on overdraft and that subsidize the higher uh, 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 accounts of, of uh, the the customers. And so there really is an unequal banking system and, and really so the banking system itself is supported by uh, vast public infrastructure. And so uh, having the unbanked, I, I don't think is just an economic problem. It's, it's a problem of democracy is if we're gonna support the banking system, we should make sure that it provides equal access to all. Thank you very, very much, Professor. My time is about up, and I'd like to recognize Senator Lee, but I fear that he is voting. Senator Lee, are you with us? And if not, um, I believe Congressman Swikert is next, but he's... David, if you're here, I'd love to recognize you. And failing that... Um, no, David, there you are. So oh, our, our ranking uh, Republican I, member on the House side. Thank of the, you, um, Chairman. Can you floor skip, yours. skip me for a moment? Uh, okay. I'm having to deal with one other group that needed an answer on something. <laughs> you know the chaos we live in, because yeah, I, 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 I have some questions for the panel. I, I, I do. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, is, uh, is Mr. Arrington with us? Jody, I know you're around. Um, let me let me move on, here Mr. Estes. The uh, oh, Jody, you're here. Um, so, Congressman Arrington from Texas, um, due to various missing senators, you are up. <laughs> wow, that was quick. I wasn't as prepared, but I enjoyed hearing everybody's uh, testimony. I want to thank the witnesses and uh, Chairman. Thank you for uh, uh, holding this uh, important discussion. Um, and it is important. Uh, I, I don't have to be black to be concerned about the disparity, uh, the gap in wealth for my fellow Americans who happen to be black um, or of any color. I want Americans to succeed. I, I um, And I, I think that's the prevailing view of Americans, by the way, is that we want everybody to, um, to realize their greatest God-given potential and feel like they can pursue their dreams and realize as much success as the next person uh, by putting in the hard work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the reality is there's a gap, uh, and, and I acknowledge that. What I'm trying to discern is how much of that is based on systemic policies, laws, systemic societal sort of public policy issues versus the you know other factors systemic factors in the black community and i've read the data like everybody else about children born out of wedlock and the marriage rates that were the same as whites 
and Hispanics in the 1960s now it's significantly lower. I've read about the higher, uh, disproportionately higher crime rates among Black Americans. And so, you know, for me, my first question is what can, I think all too often, folks, we think that the federal government's going to solve all this. You know, just because we passed laws that said it is illegal to discriminate doesn't mean that we were able to change the hearts of people. And so there were lingering effects in our society. And by the way, racism, discrimination, segregation, deplorable, intolerable, and by the way, illegal. So what, Mr. Rowe, let me just ask you, what do you, um, if you were gonna sort of gauge the factors of law and policy um, versus systemic issues, um, familial issues, norms in the black community, um, where, where would that fall? Is it 50-50? Is it half the laws we need to change and then half the black community sort of norms that need to change from the grassroots up in terms of family, community, institutions? So I'll stop there because that's, that's a long-winded question. I hope, I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, well, thank you for the thank you for the question. Let me actually just first say that in 2019, only one third of all eighth grade students in our country scored proficient on the National Assessment of, Pro of Progress in Reading, often referred to as the nation's report card. And since it was first administered in 1992, less than half of the nation's white students in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grades scored proficient in reading. I mean, consider that. There has never been a majority of white kids reading at grade level. So the sad irony, if you look at education as one example of a gap, the sad irony is that closing the black-white achievement gap in terms of academic outcomes in reading would simply mean that black kids uh, are growing from sub-mediocrity to full mediocrity, right? So this obsession with the gaps ignores the fact that a lot of kids of all races are not doing well, and that's the foundation. And so we, we have to be careful because it's not because of systemic racism that the majority of white kids in our country for generations have not been able to read at grade level. There must be other factors, both policy-wise and uh, uh, norm-wise. I mean, in terms, of, in terms of family structure, it certainly is true uh, uh, that, that um, you know, non-marital birth rates are a factor. You know, my research focuses on non-marital births to women age 24 and under. In 2019, for the 10th consecutive year, at least 70% of births to all women in that age group were outside of marriage, according to the CDC. By race, the non-marital birth rate for Black women 24 and under was 91%. It was 61% for white women age 24 and under. This is an equal opportunity tsunami. In addition, nearly 40% of unmarried women age 24 and under who gave birth in 2019 were already mothers, giving birth to at least their second child. Given these multiple births, unmarried women age 24 and under who gave birth in 29 alone were raising an estimated 850,000 to 1 million children according to CDC. And look, I'm, there's no guarantee that being a single mom means that you're doomed to failure, nor does it mean that being uh, a, a child of married two-parent households is a guarantee for success. But the data is overwhelming. This pattern of out-of-wedlock childbearing is often established at a young age. Almost two-thirds in 2019, 64% of first out-of-wedlock births were to women 24 and under. Like kids of teen mothers, these children are at much greater risk of experiencing child poverty, poor education, lack of upward mobility, traumatic stress, and many other adverse childhood experiences that impede their ability to generate wealth later in life. We just have to be honest about these conversations. If we want to reduce such risks and mitigate the economic distress that usually ensues for both parent and child, of all races, this is not just a black problem. We must educate adolescents about the likely outcomes associated with different behaviors and encourage them to think critically about the steps and timing of family formation. Well said, thank you so much, Chairman, for the indulgence and again to the witnesses. Thank you guys and God bless.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Aronson. I now uh, will yield five minutes to the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Wonderful Thank member of this committee, Ms. Beatty. Thank you so much, Chairman Byers, for not only hosting this committee, but bringing in witnesses that have been able to speak to this uh, issue, whether I agree 100% or not, it has certainly been educational. Uh, when I think uh, about the words I've heard, better life, bootstraps, race versus class, disparities, trapped, education, choice, gifts of inheritance verse none, versus none. Uh, a lot of data, a, a lot of information, but we are still, in my opinion, feeling the headwinds of systemic racism. We are still looking at the data that tells us when we look at examining the wealth gap in the United States, no matter what factors you believe in, I can give you a story of both sides. I can tell you about the teen mother that birthed her first or second child before she was 18, that now sits on a powerful corporate board. And I can tell you about Another one like that same female that is still living in poverty. But conversely, I can tell you about the well-educated child with advanced degrees that was denied because of redlining, buying a home, that wasn't able to get her car financed at a rate that many of us would be. So these stories go both ways because racism is racist. This is extremely important to me today because, as you know, I chair the subcommittee on diversity and inclusion. And next week, we will be holding a hearing, uh, I think at the end of the month, in the House Financial Subcommittee, Mr. Chairman. And, and it's holding a hearing that talks about the legacy of George Floyd and the examination of financial services industry comments to economics, racial justice. And you can't talk about economic and racial injustices without talking about the wealth gap, without looking at much of what, thank goodness, you have brought before us to, today. So I have a question to the panelists. As I go into this hearing next week, talking about the injustices, of the injustices that we're facing in the nation, the injustices because of this pandemic that none of us had ever lived through with COVID-19. We know it's healthcare, we know it's the economy, and we know it's social injustices. What do you think that I should focus on to get the attention of the nation as we talk about the wealth gap, the economy in relationship to social justice. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, my good friend, Derek Hamilton. I had to get that in, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, because he spent a lot of time in Ohio uh, and we've had a, a opportunity to spend a, a lot of time together. So first question goes to you, Derek. And good friend. follow up with Bear Darren. Good, good friend indeed. Thank you, Representative Beatty. I, I'm going to jump right into it and say I would focus on history. I would focus on the fact that the federal government created this problem, and we need an honest conversation to recognize that. And likewise, the federal government can redress this problem. So that's the good news. This is not all dismal. We can do something about it. Um, I'd also like to point out that a lot of this conversation, you know, Representative Arrington made the point that in 1950, Marriage was similar across race, but certainly we would argue that racial disparity and racism existed in 1950. If we fast forward, the reason we got this marriage gap is we incarcerate black people on mass. And also, if we think about the, the causality, family structure is as much, if not more, affected by family resources than vice versa. And that's the point of this whole conversation. The agency that resources afford and it's linked to history that have limited black people the resources so that they can intervene into getting a good education. I, you know, I'll say that umbrellas do not make it rain. We observe people with umbrellas when it's raining. So similarly, we are we observe people 
that are black with high educations having better outcomes. But if we compare across race, we know that the same college degree for a black person does not afford the same income, the same health status, the same wealth status as it does a white person. In fact, disparities across race rise with education, not decrease with education. So we need to really understand the functional roles of power, wealth, and resources, and really giving people authentic agency so that they can have economic freedom, regardless of race. Thank you so much. And thank you for that overstatement of the function of education, because I agree with that. Professor, any comments you'd like to add? Uh, just a amen to what Derek said. I mean, the thing that the history and the data reveal, just look at it honestly, and the data and the history is there, exactly as, as Derek said. And the myths have, and the causes have changed over time. So now we're talking about maybe family structure, but before it was, you know, racial mapping, right? We really had some really pernicious myths about biological differences, about divine right, about what Christianity, you know, deemed as master and slave. So these myths have changed alongside. Um, so. So let's look at this history very honestly and look at this data and, and look at the umbrella versus the rain as, as uh, Professor Hamilton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm over my time, but if I could ask all of the witnesses to give me a written statement on their opinion of the direction we should be looking at at the Tulsa massacre 100 years ago with the Black Wall Street that deals directly with today's topic. I would be interested in any of their thoughts on how we move forward. Thank you. And I yield th back. Th thank you, Congresswoman Beatty, very much. Uh, I now recognize uh, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler from Washington State for your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And this has been a really interesting discussion for me. Um, you know, having grown up, I'm actually, hopefully, if y'all can hear me. Um, grown up on the west coast uh with a hispanic father who came from total poverty um and a caucasian mother i have seen pieces of this but not all of it and i can tell you you know when i look at my dad and how he grew up um i mean there were 10 kids and there weren't always there wasn't always running water in the house like it was a very different situation and then i think about when i look at my two sides who who was able to leave money to the next generation of kids on so my mom's side versus my dad's side i it's a difference and and when you speak about wanting you know adults today needing to take care of their parents that's true across um, this country we're seeing that in a lot of areas but certainly makes sense that if you know you're taking care of a generation that grew up in jim crow or grew up uh, grew up in a, situ a situation where the government really just literally made certain things illegal um, that those are going to be burdens that this generation has to bear and so how do we fix some of those inequities that were um that were put into place and that we're still living with. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Brown about was you mentioned, uh, you know, the paying for, sorry, I was writing notes in multiple places, paying for, um, you know, having to help elderly parents. Um, I have a, a bill in with uh, Congresswoman uh, Katie Porter from California that would change the um, the dependent care accounts to bring them up to inflation. So they, so you know, I think about it often in terms of child care help because that's expensive for the middle and working class families. Um, it's expensive for everybody, but you know, on either end, there tends to be some either help or self self ability to do it. But it's those middle work, you know, working class people who get really squeezed. But this also would allow you to then pay for dependent care for parents or the generation ahead of you. Um, and I didn't know if you'd heard about it or you've looked at some of those ideas, but that's another way to use the tax code um, to empower families to meet their own needs. Um, without the government saying this is how you have to use it and i wanted to submit that because i know uh, the tax policy is a big obviously in your wheelhouse um and the other thing i wanted to ask about oh go ahead I no i hadn't heard about that and to the extent that black americans would be able to avail themselves of that policy that would be uh forward progress well if there's a way we can make sure that that i mean that you know, I would love for you to look at it and provide your feedback to me because I'd love to hear that. And I'd love to look at it. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Rowe, you spoke of starting early with the end in mind and as part of uh, philosophy for creating opportunities of upward mobility. Um, and we know that early education during key points of a child's development are crucial for addressing gaps uh, for low income families that are often contribute to the wider racial wealth gap. And I, I represent an area that also has a very poor rural um you know white population so we see you know these some of these gaps in early education as well 
Um, and according to recent analysis, public school enrollment has dropped nationwide with the sharpest declines evident in pre-K and in kindergarten. A recent poll in 20 states showed an average of kindergarten enrollment down uh, a drop of 16%. And I was hoping maybe you could speak to how the pandemic might exacerbate that gap for disadvantaged children who have been forced out of the classroom. Um, and how can we address some of their learning loss and opportunity loss? You know, I will say I'm very frustrated. The state of uh, the state state of Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, only returned to in-person teaching within like the last two weeks. And we know that some of the children that they serve are some of the most either they're some of the poorest or the most disadvantaged. That's certainly where more of the brown and the black families live. And now they're being put up to a year behind. I was just hoping you could help speak to how we change that. No, it's a very good question. I mean, one of the things coming out of the pandemic is that many parents got a, a, a much more direct view of what was happening in their kids' education, and they're not, they're not happy. And so this idea of school choice, I think, is going to be much more in demand for families who want a high-quality education for their kids. I mean, in our schools, again, in the South Bronx, we were educating more than 2,000, but we had nearly 5,000 families on the wait list. Those families don't have time to wait for some rezoning to occur. They don't have time to wait for suddenly white people to show up and suddenly that's going to make their schools better. These are segregated schools, but that doesn't diminish our expectation of excellence. The thing that parents want now is a high quality educational option for their kids today. And so they can see, like, for example, in our schools, we started with pre-K. In fact, we started with a program where we partnered with uh, the parent-child home program. So the 18-month-old younger siblings of our current scholars had two years of home visits by an early learning specialist who would go to the home of the parent and the toddler two times per week, 30 minutes per visit, a book every week. The early learning specialist sits with the parent to build their capacity to be the at-home reading coach for two years. So by the time that toddler enters pre-K, their level of social emotional resident, um, readiness, their vocabulary acquisition is so much higher. That's the kind of policy we need. And the other reason, starting early with the end in mind, part of the reason we also talk about family structure, we need kids born into uh, family situations that are much more likely to be stable. So they get nurturing experiences and access to high quality education early. Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that. I yield back. Okay, thank you very much, Harmsville. I next recognize uh, Mr. Pokan from the state of Wisconsin. Mark, Mark, we can't hear you yet. Another couple. Well, 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 you're fooling with that. Um, let's move on to Mr. Peters uh, from San Diego, and then Mark will come back to you. Hopefully, we'll figure out the audio. Congresswoman Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to laugh because last last time you had someone from Duke, this time from NYU Law School, it's like you're working off my resume. So I appreciate that. And I had a question for the very well educated Professor Baradaran about the PPP loans. We had a story um, uh, on our NPR affiliate in San Diego, KPBS, that detailed the racial gaps of recipients in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and maybe many of my colleagues have those similar stories in their districts uh, regarding COVID relief funding. Minority business owners have often struggled to get federal relief because they didn't have existing banking relationships. Um, so in response, uh, in a subsequent round, Congress set up a minority set aside for those businesses so they can get access to loans without fear of tap being shut off before they can get a loan. Uh, currently, the PPP is out of funds, but there's still funding left for community development financial institutions uh, that serve low wealth areas. I wondered if you could touch on the success of these set asides for underserved businesses. And if you think there's other things Congress should be doing to improve the racial disparities in this type of federal aid. Uh, thank you for the question. It's always nice to see another NYU uh, alum. Um, I, you know, I think the, 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 the spirit in which these set asides were done is exactly the kinds of 
kind of thing that we need to recognize. Recognizing that a, a program that allows banks to choose the recipients of these um, subsidies and among their existing customers is always going to have an outcome that is both you know, yeah. disparate impact yeah. race-wise and also is gonna exclude people who are unbanked, underbanked or at the lower income. And so I think if we want to get the thing that we want, which is you know, uh, black and brown businesses and communities to get those loans, then we have to be very um, uh, thoughtful about it and, and target those communities specifically. So I do, I think the, the, the ways that um, the Fed and, and Congress has adjusted have been exactly the right kinds of uh, responses. And I would hope to see a lot more of that. I think it, it's been great. Okay, I, I, I wanna follow up with a, with a housing question too for you also. Um, San Diego, we, we look back, has a history of uh, redlining and exclusionary zoning like a lot of communities um, where uh, black and brown residents uh, were shut out from certain areas because the federal government wouldn't back home loans there. Uh, and you look at a map of the red line neighborhoods in San Diego from the 30s, it's not surprising that you see the same socioeconomic uh, status of those uh, neighborhoods reflected today. Um, can you tell me um, what would you think of the importance of home ownership as a way to, to create generational wealth um, uh, in the African American or in, in the uh, Latino American communities? Um, and what do you think our policy response should be today, uh, given where the country is? Uh, yeah, and I think that's exactly the right question. I think home ownership is at least one of several pillars of wealth building. It is still the number one asset for most middle class families, and it is a number one cause, or at least one of the top three causes of the racial wealth gap today. These red line maps, as you say, you can go on a website mapping inequality. You can see exactly. I've looked at the San Diego maps because I live right up the street, and you can see where the white flight occurred. You can look at those red line areas. You can put the census tract on them today across the country, and you have those communities remaining intact. And that's where the low access, uh, low funded schools are, right? So the schools that don't get the tax um, money, the neighborhoods that don't retain their home values, and the places that are, you know, uh, have issues with all sorts of uh, environmental hazards um, are in those formerly red line areas. And it's a result of the lack of access to political, um, uh, the political enterprise, it's lower wealth, that self perpetuate. And so I think those red lines are a great place to start. It's not, home ownership isn't the only path. I think there are, um, you know, student, uh, as, as uh, Professor Hamilton and, and uh, Professor Brown have talked about taxation, uh, student uh, lending, baby bonds, all sorts of, of sort of holistic responses. But I, I do think home ownership is at least a, a, a key pillar. Do you have an idea, though, of what policy, uh, what policy responses we might? Um, take to uh, encourage more home ownership among those underserved communities? Uh, well, I, I'm glad you asked. I did write up a, a 21st Century Homestead Act, which you know talk, looks at green financing, grants, uh, looks exactly at those red line communities yeah. and uh, puts, in, puts in money exactly where it's needed. So it's called the 21st Century Homestead Act and it's uh, online for free. <laughs> All right, great. I appreciate it, uh, Professor and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Peters, very much. And now recognize uh, Mr. David Swikert from Arizona. And I apologize to you, Mr. Chairman, um, the nature of our lives where we're juggling a handful of things at once. Um, Mr. Chairman, without uh, any objection, I'd like to actually submit a, a number of my charts because this format is a little hard holding up charts in front of a camera. Um, and uh, so with no objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hey, Without I'd like to actually, I'd like to run through because um, oddly enough, uh, I'm actually fairly familiar with Professor Brown's, um, some of her writings. And um, I just, I wanted to touch on a couple of things and make sure I have my head around. Um, have you, in, in 2017, we eliminated much of the marriage penalty. Um, Professor Brown, are, and I know it's such a short window, but did you see anything in your data or, or is there a reference point out there, um, 2018, 2019, that the changes in the marriage penalty were actually helping? So actually what I said in my testimony that while the marriage penalty for many couples was temporarily eliminated with the 2017 Act, it still remains in the earned income tax credit community yep. as well as high income 
households. And in high income households, black Americans are still more likely to pay a penalty than their white peers. But, but that was, in, as, as you've seen the charts, but that's actually sort of a, a thin, very much more wealthy strata. Um, I'm just, well, what, what I've been hunting for is trying to see before the pandemic, because um, some of the charts I just submitted is, you know, it was really our first time that wealth inequality was really, really steep, fairly steeply changing in 2018 and 2019, um, which is a personal fixation of mine, but also seeing that African-American Hispanic families, their percentages in poverty in 2018, 2019. Now, I think a lot of that was um, finally a more egalitarian value of labor. Um, you've also written about um, that we probably should take a, a real serious look at the ability to itemize deductions because that actually does skew for higher income. Like me. Um, it, you, you, you still have that mindset? Oh, absolutely. And right now we have only one in 10 Americans who are itemizing deductions. Why do we need, why do we need to keep it? All right. It, look, you'll be happy to know there's someone even on my side who reads much of your stuff. So I am very happy. Thank you. Oh, no, it's a fascinating subject because and I'm hoping um, Chairman Byer in the coming weeks, we can actually have a discussion of how much of the um, spending in the United States is actually subsidizing the very, very, very rich. We're actually working on a small project that demonstrates that um, when we discuss changing capital gains taxes and some of those things, we may create some distortions in the economy that produce productivity that therefore really hurt working people's wages. But on the other hand, we spend a trillion plus dollars subsidizing the rich. You know, the you know, flood uh, subsidized flood insurance for your multi-million dollar house on the coast or see our discussions in salt. Um, uh, Mr. Rowe, or Dr. Rowe, um, uh, I'm fascinated because being from Arizona, um, you know, my, my ethnic breakdowns are a little bit different. I represent a couple of tribal communities. Um, my Hispanic population, which I think sometimes our se census definition of Hispanic is a little more complex, um, has been becoming very entrepreneurial. With what you're doing with education, are you seeing a model where I could bring that to my Native American communities, to my Hispanic communities, for even us out in the Southwest. What can we do to help sort of the, these, this class stratification that we seem to be going back to? Well, it's good. Again, I'll, I'll start with my own personal experience uh, in, in the South Bronx. There, right now, there are 5,000 families waiting on a wait list to get into a great school. And if you had a great idea, if you had the idea to launch a great school today, you couldn't do it because there's a cap on the number of charter schools. There are incredible people, uh, uh, incredible black leaders who want to start amazing schools for kids and they can't. It's crazy. School choice exists for middle and upper uh, class families across the country. But for some reason, we want to restrict choice for the very people who need it most. And as in one example of what choice can matter, the school system that we're launching next year, Vertex Partnership Academies, will be an international baccalaureate program that both has a diploma pathway, which is a pathway to college, and the international baccalaureate careers pathway, which will be a, a, a pathway where you can have an industry credential with labor, labor market value upon graduation. Hmm. Both of equal uh, uh, status, but it recognizes the fact that we want to create options for kids, no matter what they choose to do. And the more that we build in these kind of apprenticeship models, internship models in the 11th and 12th year of high school, that's what gives kids more choice and a pathway to building wealth. But we can't get there if parents don't even have the ability to choose great schools for their kids. Well, and there becomes our great battle of Will our brothers and sisters be willing to take on the teachers unions? So, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patient with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Schweikert. And now recognize Mr. Pocan. 
Hopefully. Is it working? working? You're good. Thank All right. You. Thanks, Mark. Sorry about that. We tested in the beginning, but something happened. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of our witnesses. Um, I, I'm going to slightly change the order because I, I was watching the last uh, questions, and I serve on Education and Labor Committee as well as the appropriate committee on um, appropriations for education. And you know, my experience with charter schools, especially private charter schools, is uh, they have a dismal uh, rate of success. Uh, many get money and never open. I was watching Professor Hamilton's head nodding during that. Would you like to make some comments about uh, that? Uh, because I don't know if taking money from public schools is in the best interest of uh, solving the racial wealth gap. Yeah, I, thank you for that. And there's a certain amount of irony that Mr. Rowe began his comments by uh, touting his credentials in uh, being a public school uh, graduate and, and always going to public schools. He also pointed out the fact that he graduated from Brooklyn Tech, which is a specialized high school in New York City, that one might argue has a talented and gifted curriculum. I think that issue is we need to have pervasive, talented and gifted curriculum throughout the school system so that we're not engaged in zero sum battles about some schools offering it and others not. Um, so I, I think an investment in public schools, and we can do this, we, you know, America, it, you know, I don't have to tell you all, is a very powerful country with a great deal of resources. We can get committed teachers throughout public school systems that are empathetic to the experiences of students and make sure everybody has a talented and gifted curriculum and not segregated within and across schools where black students don't have access to that curriculum, but white students do. Thank you, Professor Hamilton. And Professor Rowe is giving you a thumbs up, so that's good. That's invest in our public schools. I agree. Um, let me ask a question about the child uh, tax credit. You know, we in the American uh, Rescue Plan have a child tax credit in there, and often we know that a lot of uh, black children have not been able to receive the maximum child tax credit uh, because it wasn't fully refundable and, and people are too little to get the full credit. We made it fully refundable. I'm looking at uh, Professor Brown, you're nodding your head. This is apparently how I ask questions if I see nodding. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Is that something we should make permanent? Would that help the racial wealth gap? Yes, absolutely. And I just want to say I was born and raised in the South Bronx. So Mr. Rowe is not the only Bronx I hear. I just want to say that. Okay, so absolutely it should be made permanent. But because it wasn't fully refundable, there were a lot of Black and Latinx children who, who were, should have been valued and weren't able to benefit from the provision. Great, thank you. And then also, uh, Professor Brown, because you brought this up in your opening comments, um, I am a huge proponent of Pell Grants. Uh, having been a recipient growing, growing up in a lower middle class family, um, I don't want to take the ladder up with me, but I, I think that Pell Grants, uh, right now working with Bobby Scott on a very significant bill, in the next few weeks they'll be uh, released. Can you talk a little more about the Pell Grants and fixing some of the problem when it comes to higher education access, as well as uh, the treatment of student loan debt, how it currently exacerbates uh, the wealth gap and uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, interest rates, because I've got a bill to allow people to refinance student loans, uh, can you use that, that group of questions? Yes, yeah, so Pell Grants, um, right now, 70% of black college students receive Pell Grants, as opposed to something like 30 something percent of white college students. And Pell Grants have not kept up with inflation. When they were first proposed, Pell Grants paid for roughly 70 something percent of college, and right now it pays for 20 something percent. So increasing Pell Grants significantly is going to be important to black college graduates in the future graduating with significantly lower debt. Because right now college student debt is crippling the black community. Uh, not only because black students graduate with more debt, but there's a significant percentage of black students who start college who never graduate, but they leave with high amounts of debt. So anything to decrease the amount of college debt would be a great thing going forward. Great, thank you. And I don't know if I can give this justice. I know I can't in 36 seconds, but we haven't talked about uh, reparations and Sheila Jackson has, Lee has a bill that I'm on to try to have a commission to study reparations. Anyone wanna take a quick 26 second crack at it, please. Professor Hamilton, I see you nodding. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, uh, reparations is a necessary ingredient if we're ever gonna get beyond the historical sin at our inception 
that has devalued black lives. America needs to take account, atone for it, and redress it. I mean, and also it will benefit poor people writ large because it will ground inequality in what it's actually grounded in, not deficit behaviors, not deficit attitudes, but rather resources and ensure that every American, black or white, is properly resources so that they can truly benefit from the activities of a market or whatever agency they want to offer to attain their self-determined goals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the indulgence. Um, I yield back. Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman Pogan. Okay, and now we get to hear with uh, the former secretary of, former treasurer of Kansas, who had a lot of responsibility for resources, Mr. Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, America remains a beacon of hope for millions around the globe who live without freedom or opportunity. And while hurdles certainly exist for many in our country, including family instability, unaffordable housing, and as mentioned earlier, failing schools, the United States remains a leader in economic opportunity and entrepreneurial drive. Our country provides Americans an equal opportunity to improve their economic situation through things like hard work, self-discipline, education, and a committed family. This success sequence goes beyond helping Americans with their financial goals, but to truly achieve the American dream. Yet many Americans do face real hurdles, and I believe we must find solutions for those. We need to understand why housing is so expensive and what's causing the epidemic of family instability in our culture. The National Association of Home Builders recently said that building homes cost an average of $36,000 more than last year, and a fourth of that price is due to, to regulations. This includes higher lumber prices, gas shortages, and a labor shortage. If owning a home is a key to building wealth and passing it down to children and grandchildren, which I believe it is, we need to look at policies that help Americans save money on homes like less regulations and lower taxes. Rather than punish Americans who climbed up the economic ladder, we need to look for ways to help open the doors of opportunities for all Americans. Uh, one example of common sense policy that helped create economic opportunity was a, a recent reform in my home state of Kansas that will decrease occupational licensing requirements for military families who move into Kansas. It'll cut down wait times from 60 to only 15 days for military members and their families, allowing military spouses to return to work sooner after relocating. This is an example of a simple reform that's focused on expanding opportunity by cutting red tape and ultimately helping increase the wealth of others. I think it's important that we point out in America that wealth is not a pie. If someone works hard and does well, they're not taking away from someone else's piece of the pie. In fact, they may be helping create an even bigger pie by creating a job for them. Unfortunately, we're pursuing policies today that make it harder for that to happen. Tax hikes and more regulations will combine to form barriers to affordable housing for Americans who are trying to build wealth. I want to turn to Mr. Rowe and ask a few questions. Uh, Mr. Rowe, your work's helped many succeed. Uh, what are some of the key ingredients uh, to, to uh, creating more of these success stories? I believe you're on view. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for the question. I, I will once again uh, proudly say I'm a, a graduate of the New York City Public School System and Brooklyn Tech. Uh, and it is, it's one of the specialized high schools in New York. And there's frustration that there aren't enough black and Hispanic kids going to Brooklyn Tech. So what has been the idea, the idea to somehow increase the number of black and Hispanic kids is to eliminate the objective standard, eliminate the assessment it's so they're reducing the standard. So instead of saying, how do we improve the quality of education K through eight so that more kids can compete to, to, to be successful in these specialized high schools? And why don't we create more great high schools as I'm doing, launching Vertex Partnership Academy so that kids in the Bronx, those 5,000, and that's just for our network, tens of thousands of families are desperate desperate for a great chance to go to a school like Brooklyn Tech. I agree, we need all of our public schools. I champion public schools. That's why I run public charter schools. And you mentioned the success sequence. I, I do think it's important uh, for folks to know, you know, in 2017, there was a report called the Millennial Success Sequence that found that a stunning 91% of black people avoided poverty when they reached their prime young adult years, age 28 to 34, 
if they followed what's called the success sequence. And again, that's no guarantee, but that's a term. But essentially, they earned at least a high school degree, worked full time, so they learned the dignity and discipline of work, and married before they had children in that order. And this is not the only study. Raj Chetty, in his study, Where is the Land of Opportunity? The Geography of Intergenerational Mobility in the United States. He studied uh, intergenerational, intergenerational mo mobility of more than 40 million children and their parents. He found that hyperlocal factors, most notably measures of father presence and marriage rates in a given location, drive upward mobility. If we know that, we have to make that part of the conversation. Well, thank you. And and uh, as, 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 as you are, I'm also a proud graduate of public schools, and uh, I insisted that uh, my kids, kids go to public schools. I wanted them to get good education there. I also want to make sure that when public schools are failing, that we can come up with opportunities to make those work right and, and improve, hold them accountable so that they can help all children. So I, I appreciate the time, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Congressman Estes, thank you very much. And now recognize my good friend, the Congressman from Maryland, Mr. Crum. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Byer and Ranking Member Lee for uh, holding this hearing. And thanks to the witnesses for joining us. I'm going to talk a little bit about equity. Uh, Professor Hamilton, uh, it's clear with COVID uh, had a disproportionate uh, negative impact on our minority owned businesses. And during these difficult times, many Americans have had to make really impossible decisions with their families to keep their companies afloat. We've been working with our colleagues to find solutions for these struggling businesses. The Paycheck Protection Plan you know, literally saved 50 some thousand jobs in my district alone. But when you looked at the numbers, it was clear Black, Hispanic, women-owned businesses in Maryland 6th District were disproportionately excluded from this important program. That's why we helped lead efforts to increase the outreach to small business, people of color, women, with the Jobs and Neighborhood Investment Act, which was almost $18 billion investment to do eligible community development financial institutions and minority deposit institutions with capital, liquidity, operational capacity to put this flow into low-income minority communities. Uh, in recent months, the vaccine is beginning to work and we're returning to a new normal. So in this new phase of this pandemic, how do we best support minority-owned businesses? Thank you for that. I, you know, the biggest pre-existing condition of them all is what we're talking about today, and that's wealth. That minority businesses were undercapitalized to start with. Those with capital are better protect, protected during a pandemic. Those with capital are better positioned to benefit from government policies that are enacted. And the PPP provided an example. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Brown, has pointed out that uh, some, because of existing banking relationships, certain businesses were uh, better positioned to benefit than others. So we need to do things to redress this. Uh, and let me also point out some of the good things. Uh, we, we saw that with the PPP, it was effectively grants, not just loans. It was, it was uh, distributed in the form of loans, but they were forgivable loans. We need only look at history and set, show that government can... Uh, direct capital in a way to provide a foundation so that businesses can flourish. I think what we need to be cognizant of is that we need to be intentionally inclusive based on race and gender and pursuing these capital finance products. So what does that mean? It means to recognize that if we're going to do it through banks, that some businesses will have better banking relationships than others. There's no reason that we can't establish the right to an account not only for every American, but every businesses. If that's in a, in a modern day 21st century, we can do things like that. So, you know, I would, I would argue that we need to do more of, of emphasizing providing direct capital to these businesses and distributing in a way to recognize the history of, of ways that, we, in, that they have been excluded and intentionally being inclusive going forward. I agree, the lack of capital is a major, major issue here. Uh, let's jump over to Professor um, Buradan. 
I'm sure I got that wrong. But uh, quickly here, how can we ensure investments in the American Families Plan, the American Jobs Plan can be targeted at these longstanding racial wealth gap that we have in this country? Um, yes, thank you for the question. It's uh, uh, Baradaran. And um, I, uh, I, you know, I think if we, we want to target them to the communities, uh, we can just do it directly. Um, you know, the, the red line maps, these racial gaps and uh, were not created accidentally. Uh, the FHA mapping of this country, the way that these policies were created were not race neutral. They were not colorblind. Uh, they were explicit about, look, there are black people that live in this neighborhood and we will not lend to that neighborhood. And that, that was true, you know, through racial covenants and they were very, very explicit. Uh, now, obviously we can't be very explicit anymore, but those explicit racial uh, exclusions still remain, those effects remain. And so you really do have to target uh, those places and bring up that that need here, right? I mean, the same thing with the PPP loan. If you kind of throw water in a valley, that that's going to uh, accumulate at the bottom. And so, any program we put atop an unequal system, you're going to have unequal results until you change that that playing field, the topography of the country. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Makes a lot of sense, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Prohn, very much. I recognize the the good Senator, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Byers. Mr. Rowe, um, would reparations uh, effectively address the wealth gap? Of, oops, sorry, I'm much more a fan of encouraging entrepreneurship in the black community because we have a rich history of doing so. But as the others have said, getting access to initial capital is part of the big problem, right? So how do we actually- I accept that, I accept that, but that's not reparation. So if I can, I just have limited time, I don't mean to cut you off. Um, and I don't know quite how it's supposed to be structured, but is there financial literacy pervasive enough in the African-American community that could, if given a large, sump, a large lump sum of money, an individual or a family would be able to handle that money wisely? I say that not pejoratively, but just because financial literacy is so important to do so. Well, I, I think financial literacy is important for people of all races. It's not just absolutely, their absolutely. Yeah, that, that, yeah. So that, the, the, one of the interesting things that's happening is that there are many new models emerging around how to encourage entrepreneurship, particularly in the black community. I, I'm so, going to back you off because I have some questions. I just, okay. I, I will note that financial literacy. I spoke to a man yesterday who's very engaged in creating it within the African American community. <laughs> But again, folks, particularly who are lower socioeconomic, typically have poor financial literacy. Um, um, so just to point that out, I'm not quite sure. Mr. Well, uh, Dr. School, Hamilton. School choice can help there too, because there are great you. schools that are teaching financial literacy. We, in our own schools- Hang on, I'm sorry, I'm coming back to you. Okay. Dr. Hamilton, are you really opposed to school choice? Uh, I'm exposed to diverting resources from establishing a public school system that entitles every American to a high quality stop, education. So let me stop you for a second. So during the pandemic, teachers unions would not allow public schools to open, but private and parochial did, and many charter schools did. Now, should we have kept the resources in the public schools that did not open, or should we have allocated them to the schools that actually opened? Because we know that people in poverty and children of color were particularly impacted by not having in-person experience. So over this last year, should we have just given everything to the public schools that didn't open, or should we have given some to those that did? So I got two quick responses. One is uh, going back and saying financial literacy is practically useless for families with no finances to manage in the first place. If you, and going back to the, the, the question- I'll come back to that, but if you'd answer the question I ask you, please. Sure. Uh, I think the pandemic posed some nuanced questions that requires a more nuanced answer than a simple <laughs> yes or no to the question you posed. I it was not a yes or no. Should the money have been stayed in a public school system that did not open and did not serve the children of poverty who are disproportionately affected by not by having an in-person experience, or should it have flowed to benefit those children even if they're attending a charter, private, or parochial school? I think in a global pandemic with grave health risks, first and foremost, we need to protect people and make sure they're not at risk of mortality. I'm not, I'm answering it directly. But, 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 but it was well established that transmission was not occurring in school settings. 
and public, private, and parochial, I mean, uh, excuse me, charters, private, and parochial reopened, and there was not in-school transmission. And public schools kept taking it as a dodge, and we had a whole year of life lost for these children who lacked that education. Should the money have been diverted to those schools that were actually open to benefit those children? The answer is the money should have been directed in a way to make all schools open safely and securely. So let me, let me stop there. My wife is involved with a public charter school because clearly, clearly you don't want to answer that question. And no, I'm a little bit frustrated <laughs> because I can tell you those kids have been penalized. They've been penalized and we supposedly are advocating for them. But no, it's more about teachers unions than it is about those children. And let me just say this. My wife is involved with the public charter school for children with dyslexia. We can look at black and brown children. 50% of them do not read on grade level by grade three. Now, many of them are dyslexic. They're not diagnosed. Should the African-American mamas who choose to send their children to that charter school have the right to send their children to a charter school which addresses their children's dyslexia, or no, should they be stuck in a school which does not address it? Well, as Representative Peters pointed out, there's no empirical evidence to suggest that charter school outcomes on mass lead to better outcomes than public school outcomes. But the nice thing is they, we... they shut down. That's the that's the other nice thing about them. If they fail, they close. Whereas a public failing charter, a public failing school remains open. So so I'll concede that point, but also point out. But nonetheless, go back to my question: Should the African American mother have the right to send her child to a school which address, which is open, seeing kids, and which addresses her child's dyslexia, or should she not? I think the premise of your question limits the choice set of a scarce response that doesn't recognize a more structural uh, approach that we can do to address the problem, which is ensure that every American has access to a quality and talented gifted curriculum throughout all public schools on mass. So I guess since uh, public schools are not offering specialized curriculum for dyslexia, the only way to access it would be through a charter school, but I'm not sure I'm gonna get you to agree with that. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, very much. Uh, do we have Senator Klobuchar or Senator Warnock with us? Now, both have been bouncing, but among other hearings. If we're not, we are have come to the conclusion of the questions from our various participants. And uh, I just want to thank all of you very much for for this, uh, we got steered to an interesting conversation about charter schools, which may not be the most central piece of uh, our discussion on overcoming the gap in, in race, but, um, but it's, a, it's an important one. Yeah, it's it, it's important that we talk about everything from from banking to baby bonds to change in the law and the tax structure. Uh, I learned an, an amazing amount today, and I'm really grateful for for all the different perspectives that you offer. And we have a lot to follow up on. I know we'll be looking at, you know, Elizabeth Warren has a bill on postal services and banking. Um, I'd love to look at the 21st Century Homestead Act. And every time I talk to Professor Hamilton, I, my list gets a lot longer. Um, so we're, 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 we're very grateful for all you've done. So let may me I, formally say. May I make one final comment about financial literacy? Yes, please. I just want to again and give another example of something that we do in our schools and could be emulated starting at in our pre-k with our four-year-olds we set up college savings accounts of 50 dollars, and we parents would set up and we would match every single year and what was really interesting for our four-year-olds they had now a college savings account in their name and what our parents told us it was it changed their dinner conversations about the future, and it's just so even though they weren't huge amounts of money, it changed the way that young people looked at their future and their level of ownership. And this idea of college was something that was really important. So I think there are ways, even in extremely in extreme poverty, to introduce this idea of saving, financial literacy, delayed grat delayed gratification, all of these things, a future orientation that can be very powerful. Yes, Pretty good case for baby bonds. We're going to get you to come testify for this. I, 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 we, we should talk about baby bonds. A quick response is to say that I'm all for assets and, and going towards children, but the reality is that those savings accounts as described and structured 
when that child becomes a young adult and is ready to go to college, they won't nearly have enough resources so that they can afford that child a debt free college education, despite the reorientation. This issue centers on capital. Oh, I, 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 would, I would love for this to go on, but this is so great. <laughs> I, I will tell you, as a longtime businessman, too, it's always more fun to count your own money than somebody else's. <laughs> and it ratchets up your financial um, skills greatly when, when you have something to actually count. So, so let, me, let me formally say that uh, wealth, as we discussed today, is an enabler of opportunity. It places the promise of the American dream within reach for generations, but the persistence of the racial wealth gap gets in the way of this promise and hinders our nation's economic growth. And Congress must continue to think about ways in which we can help black and brown families bridge this wealth divide. So thank you to our legal scholars, Professor Brown, Professor Baradaran, for helping us understand how public policy and our tax laws continue to perpetuate the existing racial disparities in credit, banking, and wealth. Your equity analysis and focus on solutions helps us to think more creatively about how the federal government can help bridge the gap. And thank you, Mr. Rowe, for sharing your expertise in education. Um, good luck with, with Vertex next year. Um, and uh, thank you for reminding us the liberating force of equality education. And thank you to our economist, Dr. Hamilton, for helping us see how the stratification of our economy affects the wealth of black families and seeing the deterministic role that wealth plays in a range of outcomes that was nowhere to begin. I thank all of my colleagues for joining this important discussion. There's so much we can do to right our wrongs, to make the tax code more equitable, to facilitate banking services and credit, and to grant every child an opportunity to build wealth and follow their dreams. So we have our work cut out for us. We hope we'll be working with all of you closely again, year in, year out. Thanks for your participation today. The record will remain open for three business days. And with that, the hearing is formally adjourned. And past the formal adjournment, thank all of you. This is